Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at edema. So about four months ago, I had a major leg surgery. I got plates and screws in my leg. That's the edema that's in it. These are my fingers. That was David Goggins. He's a former Navy SEAL and endurance athlete showing us his pitting edema. You can see from that video that edema is some form of swelling that's occurring in the tissue. And this swelling is often due to an expansion of interstitial fluid volume. Now, what does this mean? Well, in order to understand, we need to take a look at the various compartments of the body that contain fluid, how this fluid is distributed and also exchanged between these compartments. So to begin, you need to understand that 50 to 60% of your body is actually water. So out of your entire body, 50 to 60% is water. Now, how is this water distributed? Well, you can break it down into the way it's distributed within the cells of our body. So we call that intracellular and the way it's distributed outside the cells of our body called extracellular. Now, you may sometimes see it written as ICF, intracellular fluid, and you may see this written as extracellular fluid. And what you'll find is that of this 50 to 60 percent of water within your body, two thirds of it is actually within the cells. So most of this water is inside the cells of your body. And then one third of it is sitting outside the cells of your body. And you can further break down the extracellular compartment into two more compartments. You've got the interstitial area, And you've got the intravascular area. So intravascular is inside the blood vessels. Interstitial is between the cells and outside the cells. Not within, but between the cells and outside the cells. Now the important thing is both of these are extracellular fluid compartments. And so that means that they freely exchange things with one another. The things they freely exchange is fluid and solutes. Remember, solutes are the things that are dissolved within the fluid. So this is gases, this is nutrients, this can also be ions, for example, like sodium and potassium. So they freely exchange these things with one another. So let's take this and apply it to what I've drawn up here. So first thing you can see is that I've got the left hand side of the heart. We know the left hand side of the heart. When it contracts, it generates a huge amount of force. It needs to because it needs to deliver oxygen rich, nutrient rich blood to the tissues of the body. <clears throat> now when it does this, it needs to generate this high force. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the highest force that it generates is 120 millimeters of mercury and it pushes it through arteries, large arteries, then smaller arterioles, and then it gets to a capillary bed. The capillary bed is porous, there's holes in it, which means it can start distributing the components within this blood. So that's the gases and nutrients, oxygen predominantly and nutrients. On the other side of the capillary bed, we have venules, which are small veins, which then turn into large veins, which then goes back to the right-hand side of the heart. That right hand side of the heart goes to the lungs to get oxygenated, goes back to the left hand side of the heart, and the whole process starts again. Now you can see that this area in here is the intravascular area that I wrote down here, which is part of the extracellular fluid. So let's write that up. This is part of the ECF. The interstitial area, I said, is between and outside and surrounding the cells. So all of this area around here, this is the interstitial area, and that is also classified as extracellular fluid. Intracellular is inside these cells here, intracellular fluid, okay, of these cells there. Now another thing I've drawn up here, which I'll get to shortly, and is very important in edema, is the lymphatic system. So, let's take a look and see how these fluids, we know that they're distributed within these various compartments, but how do they exchange? 
All right, first thing is, left side of the heart contracts really hard, generates a high amount of force. Its maximal amount of force is around about 120 millimeters of mercury, and the mean arterial pressure is about 90 millimeters of mercury. But by the time it gets to a capillary bed, just of a general tissue of the body, let's say the legs, for example, that pressure is gonna be around about 35 millimeters of mercury. And remember, what's this blood pressure doing? It's exerting some sort of force on the walls of these vessels. By the time it gets to the capillary bed, the force that's exerted on the walls of the vessels of the capillary bed means it can start pushing substances out of these little holes, the pores. And like I said, this outward pushing force is 35 millimeters of mercury. Now we don't call this the blood pressure necessarily, we call it hydrostatic pressure hydrostatic pressure. That's the outward pushing force. Fluid, so plasma, with its solutes are now moving out. And I told you, fluid and solutes can readily exchange from the intravascular to the interstitial area. But things are remaining in this blood vessel, right? Things are remaining, things that are too big to get out, things that aren't dissolved, like red blood cells, white blood cells, and most importantly here, proteins. So proteins are remaining inside the blood vessel. An important point you need to know is proteins are negatively charged. That's important. Now think about this. If something's negatively charged, remember water. What's something you need to understand about water? Water, if I were to draw it up here, <clears throat> is H. Two O, two hydrogen, one oxygen, right? So let's draw that up. Here's a hydrogen, here's one oxygen, oh, sorry, here's one hydrogen, and there's the other hydrogen, H2O. They have a slight charge associated with them. So the hydrogen has a slight positive charge, and the oxygen has a slight negative charge. Now this is a really important thing to understand about water. It means that negative things are attracted to water and water is attracted to negative things because of the hydrogen here. But the same goes for positive stuff. So positive stuff is attracted to water because of the negative oxygen, but the negative oxygen of the water is also attracted to the positive things. That's important. Now think about it. This fluid that's being pushed out is mostly water, but we've now got all of this negative protein staying inside the capillary bed, what do you think that means? It means it's gonna exert an opposing inward pull. There's gonna be an opposing inward pull that's happening. Now if we were to take a look at this opposing inward pull on the arterial end of the capillary bed, right? So you can see that there's an arterial end and a venous end. Let's stick to the arterial end. Let's have a look at this inward pull. This inward pull that's happening due to the proteins is 25 millimeters of mercury worth of pressure. 25 millimeters of mercury. And it's called the oncotic pressure. Oncotic pressure. So we've got two pressures so far. Number one, hydrostatic, the outward push. Number two, the oncotic, which is the inward pull. Now think about this, as we move across and things are leaking out, think about a hose. You've got this nice long hose attached to a tap and you put holes in it every maybe, let's say one meter, you put a hole in it and you turn the tap on. The hole closest to the tap is gonna squirt out the strongest, the highest pressure. Then the next one, the pressure's gonna be a little bit lower because stuff's come out. Then the next one, the pressure's lower and the next one, pressure's lower again. The same thing happens as you move across the capillary bed. By the time you get to the venous end of the capillary bed, the hydrostatic pressure, the outward push, is reduced. It's reduced to about 20 millimeters of mercury. 20 millimeters of mercury. All right, what's the inward pull? Well, the proteins haven't moved. So you've still got an inward pull of 25 millimeters of mercury still have an inward pull of 25 millimeters of mercury. Now let's compare the difference here. On the arterial end, 
You've got 35 pushing out, 25 pulling in. What's the difference? 10 millimeters of mercury. Who wins this? Well, the hydrostatic pressure wins, so fluid gets pushed out. On the venous end, what's the difference? It's five millimeters of mercury, but what wins is the inward pull. So stuff gets pulled in on this side. So stuff comes out this side, stuff goes in this side. Isn't that wonderful? That's how we maintain our intravascular fluid volume. Then that fluid continues off to the right-hand side of the heart. Remember, on this side, we're delivering oxygen and nutrients, and on this side, we're taking away carbon dioxide and wastes. So that is absolutely amazing. But the thing is, not all the fluid gets pulled back in. What you'll find is that some fluid remains out in the interstitial area, and this fluid gets reclaimed by the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system, luckily, will deliver this fluid back into our venous supply, which will then go back to the right-hand side of the heart, meaning we don't lose fluid, and the fluid doesn't accumulate in the interstitial area. Now, I've put two points here. Hydrostatic point, really important. Oncotic point, really important. There's two more you need to understand. First of which is the endothelial membrane of the capillary. So let's put a little arrow here and write it up here. Number three is capillary, capillary endothelium. That's really important when it comes to this fluid balance and fluid exchange. And number four is the lymphatic system. So, now we can talk about edema. Edema, these four things, need to be thought about all the time when it comes to edema. Edema is, I told you, it's the buildup or swelling of fluid, often due to this interstitial area increasing in volume, all right? So, how is this happening? Well, either you can get edema, and let's write it up on this side. We don't need this up here anymore. Let's get rid of that. First thing is we can look at the hydrostatic pressure. Let's take a look. Number one. Hydrostatic pressure. What could increase the likelihood of fluid going from the intravascular area to the interstitial area? Well, if we increase the hydrostatic pressure, anything that increases the hydrostatic pressure, anything that increases that hydrostatic pressure is gonna result in edema. So what could that be? I'll write this up here. Anything that increases that hydrostatic pressure. Well, we've got the left-hand side of the heart generating a force that propagates down to the capillary bed. So if this left-hand side of the heart is generating too much force, like hypertension, well, this force is gonna be greater, pushing too much blood. That 35 may go to 45, 55, for example, and more fluid gets pushed out. So maybe hypertension could be a reason. What else? Well, let's not just think about the left-hand side of the heart. What about the right-hand side of the heart? If the right-hand side of the heart no longer works, right side heart failure, it doesn't work as a pump to keep the blood moving. Blood's gonna back up. And if that blood backs up, then what happens? It's no longer 20 millimeters of mercury. That may go to 30, which means the outward pushing force is greater than the inward pulling force. So right side, heart failure. Now, think about this. I've drawn this capillary up as though it's a capillary bed of just the general tissue of the body. But you can have capillary beds all over the place. Remember, also, at the lungs. Now think about this. If the right-hand side of the heart fails, blood backs up into the capillary beds of the tissues of the body and it can force out, resulting in peripheral edema, right? If the left-hand side of the heart fails, remember that. So let's just draw this up super quick, right? If you've got the, I'm drawing up the, if I can draw it up properly. So here's the right atrium, superior inferior vena cava. There's the right ventricle. It's now 
there's the pulmonary arteries going to, where's that going to? That's going to the lungs, right? And then that brings blood back into the left ventricle. So it's going to have the pulmonary veins, which is going to be coming through from either side. That's bringing oxygenated blood back from the lungs. That then pumps it into the left ventricle, and that left ventricle has the aorta, which then comes out and delivers to the body. I know it's not the best drawing, but the point here is this. I said if the right hand side of the heart fails, you get peripheral edema. So if this right ventricle fails, blood backs up into the vena cava and that goes to the body. And that pressure increases and you get that fluid coming out. But if the left hand side of the heart fails, blood backs up where? Into the lungs. And you can have edema of the lungs called pulmonary edema. So in actual fact, if you have right side heart failure, this results in, or can result in peripheral edema. Peripheral edema. But if you have left side heart failure, you can have pulmonary edema. Now I'm Australian, so I put an O in front of the edema, but it's just the same as E-D-E-M-A. All right. Now, other things that can result in increase in the hydrostatic pressure to cause edema is what if something's blocking the vein? What if you've got some sort of obstruction, deep vein thrombosis? You've got something blocking it, blood's going to back up. So a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Deep vein thrombosis could do it. Or maybe compression of the vein, something compressing it. That could happen. Or something obstructing the vena cava, inferior superior vena cava, blood's gonna back up, right? So again, compression or obstruction or a deep vein thrombosis, DBT. These are the major causes of increasing hydrostatic pressure resulting in peripheral edema or edema. Number two, the oncotic pressure. This is that inward pulling force because predominantly we have proteins inside. So let's write up the oncotic force. Oncotic pressure. Remember, the oncotic pressure is because we have negatively charged proteins pulling stuff back in. Importantly, the most important protein here that's doing this is albumin. It's albumin. The liver produces albumin. Now, what could cause edema in regards to oncotic pressure? If it reduces. So if something happens to reduce the amount of proteins in the intravascular space, there's less of an inward pulling force and things stay out in the interstitium. So anything that's going to reduce the oncotic pressure can result in edema. Now, what could reduce the oncotic pressure? If you don't produce those proteins. Now I said the liver produces albumin, those proteins. So if you have Hepatic disease, liver disease, hepatic disease. It means you don't make these proteins. What if you've got some sort of mal, malnutrition or malabsorption? Malnutrition or malabsorption. That means you're not getting enough proteins from your nutrients or diet, or you're not absorbing enough proteins from your diet. Not getting enough proteins, not absorbing enough proteins. And again, you can have an insufficiency because of that. Or you could have renal disease. What would happen in renal disease? How does this result in a reduced proteins? Well, remember your kidneys are going to filter. So you've got afferent arteriole going to the glomerulus, efferent arteriole leaving the glomerulus, and then you've got the glomerular capsule of the nephron. Usually the membrane here at the glomerular capsule doesn't let proteins out, so proteins stay in the blood. Great. But if you've got kidney disease, this can be damaged. And if this is damaged, proteins can leak out. And if proteins leak out, where do they end up? In the pee. So you end up peeing out the proteins. So renal disease can result in this as well. So again, anything that reduces the amount of proteins or that oncotic pressure 
can result in edema. Number three, capillary endothelium. So the integrity of the endothelial wall can make a difference. The integrity of the endothelial wall. Capillary integrity. So think about this. If something has damaged the vascular supply and these walls are directly damaged, what do you think is going to happen? Proteins are going to leak out and they shouldn't, which means there's no inward pulling force. Fluid stays out in the interstitium. So you can have vascular injury could be one. Vascular injury, and this can include surgery, right? Vascular injury. And this could include surgery. And I think this is what's happening with David Goggins in that video that I showed. Or you could have inflammation. So you've got damage to the tissues of the area. These tissues or cells, if they're damaged, they can release their substances, their chemicals. And some of these chemicals include histamine, and prostaglandins. Now what histamine and prostaglandins do is they travel to the blood vessel and they dilate the arterial end so more blood gets in. They also increase the gaps in the capillaries so that big products like red blood cells, white blood cells and proteins leak out as well and again swelling. So inflammation is another really big one here inflammation. And it sort of goes along with vascular injury and surgery. All right, last thing, the lymphatic system. I told you that the lymphatic system will claim any fluid that doesn't get pulled back in and deliver it back into the venous supply. Perfect. So anything that's obstructing the lymphatic system, which could be a tumor or lymphedema. So tumor or lymphedema. Let's first write up lymphatic system. Lymphatic system. You can have a tumor or lymphedema. Tumor, lymphedema, something obstructing it. Or you could have actually parts of the lymphatic system taken out. So for example, when somebody has breast cancer and that breast cancer tissue may metastasize or the cancer may move to lymph nodes or in case this may happen down the track, they may remove those lymph nodes and some of the lymphatic system. If this whole lymphatic system is gone, the fluid that does remain here doesn't get reclaimed. And over time, it builds up. And so removal of lymphatic system. Now a final important point, so these are all the things that can cause edema to occur. Final point is that often your body tries to respond to this, to try and fix things up, maintain homeostasis. What responds is the kidneys. So when the fluid leaves the bloodstream, the kidneys sense that there's a drop in blood fluid and blood volume. And it responds by holding onto water and holding onto sodium and salt. All right. So that can be something that also goes along with this particular issue. Again, it needs to be appropriately evaluated to know how to treat it. So different treatment options mean either treating the initial cause or it could be treating the fluid buildup with diuretics, for example. It really depends on what's causing the edema. So I hope you enjoyed this. This is a quick run through of edema. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you like our videos, please hit subscribe and leave a comment.